I've been to Afghanistan some seven or eight times in the last five years alone. And every time I've gone in, I've flown into Camp Bastion. That's this sprawling British base carved out of the desert in southern Helmand. When I first went there in 2006, it was a fairly modest affair, about 10 kilometres around, a brisk 40-minute jog. Today, much expanded, a jog around the perimeter would be about 13 miles. It's half a marathon. And of course, it's full to the brim with military personnel and toppers with military equipment. Now, once there, I, like everyone else, was prepared for the front line. And that meant going through various courses, just last minute preparation, getting kitted out, that sort of thing. They try to prepare you for every eventuality. But the last course you do is battle first aid, which is a reality check to say the least. But it struck me then that why is it that military people always manage to find humour in the darkest of subjects? So what I want you to do is stand in your wet patch, find contact ID, hold your weapon, put your shades on, okay? You're now on patrol in Nad Ali North, it's all gone horribly wrong, and you've stood on that device. How high is the amputation going to be? It depends, doesn't it? It depends. We get the conical blast wave, okay? So you lift his arms up, that's what's going to happen to his arms. He's going to get fragged to the side of the chest wall. Where's that rifle going to go? Straight into his grid, he's probably going to get a fractured jaw along there. He'll probably get a fractured zygoma, a bit of blast here coming out there. He's also going to get big chunks missing out of both his legs from all the stones and crap that's come up off the floor. Lose a couple of fingers coming off there as well. Maybe a big chunk missing out of the forearm. Dislocated shoulder up there. It goes on and it goes on and it goes on. You've all missed one of the biggest injuries. Does anyone know what that is? What bone sits there? The femur. It's the biggest bone in the body. Where is that going to go when you stand on a device? <laughs> Oh, what's, yeah, it's going to smash the pelvis. Is that a massive life-threatening injury? Yeah, it is. What's going to happen to that, that bad boy there if he's not wearing his blast pants? What's the first question you royals always ask when you've been blown up? Am, am I cock and bull still there? And I'll go, yeah, but you're going to be pissing in six different directions for the rest of your life. Because why? You had your Kelvin Kleins on and not your blast pants. And it's as simple as that, guys. Show team. Touch your eye. Can you hear me? Man down, man down! Happy, go. Get to him then. Passes the socks. Right, flip him, flip him. Airway's full of blood. Airway's still full of blood. Airway's still full of blood. Now you get your socks out. Get your elbow into his. Get your elbow into his neck. Stay low. Stay low. Get some more pressure on that. Still hosing out. More pressure. Right, take your time. Take your time and do it properly now. Make a massive difference. Keep talking to him and reassuring. Right, go on, through to his shoulder. Good. Pat. Right, get it in there as quickly as you can. As quickly as you can. Keep packing it in, keep packing it in. Remove your elbow and push it in. That's it. You're all right, Tots. You're going to be all right, mate. Fucking hell, you know. Okay. <laughs> Good. They yeah, just love royals. Keep going. Happy. How, how easy was that? It's easy, isn't it? It's easy when you know how to do it, all right? So battle first day done, kitted out, ready to go. I flew to Checkpoint Turkey. This is where I was going to join Lima Company of the Royal Marines. Now, I was expecting a fortress. I was expecting at least some sort of defensive position and not just a simple compound surrounded by a collection of dried mud walls. And that's what Toki was. There's very little to recommend Toki. There's no sanitary arrangements, no running water. Well, I say that, there was a stream nearby and the lads managed to sort of um, encompass it by building a, a vast sandbag wall to divert the stream through the actual compound. Rebuilding the old wall for the swimming pool. With the temperatures soaring to 50 degrees plus at midday, it was very welcome release to just plunge into that pool. Oh, oh. oh yeah. Oh. Suddenly it's all worth it. <laughs> Get in there. Who cares what's in the water? <laughs> so the lads spent much of their time hanging around. Waiting. It is just a waiting game. Once you're out of patrol, getting on with the job, dealing with the Taliban, time passed very fast. But 90% of the time you spent waiting. Just waiting, waiting, waiting. And there's an old beat up guitar as well that uh, did the rounds. Vicey in particular loved to sing song, making up the words as he went along. <laughs> I'm hanging out, the GPS says, 800 meters to fall at. Oh fuck, <laughs> I can't make it. And some of the lads even adopted pets. Oh, it's one fluffy Christmas. duckling I remember particularly yeah. well, great favourite. <laughs> <laughs>
Oh. <laughs> I'm feeding him. We're going to change him soon. Oh. So Steve, what's the story about this little one then? Uh, right, we was on patrol the, uh, the other day in, a, in around our local area and uh, one of the lads managed to find this very sorry looking for himself puppy in the corner so we uh, purchased him off the, uh, the compound owner. How much did he cost you? Uh, he was $10. <laughs> he just thought he was a bit strange, obviously he's still got his ears and his tail and like most local dogs. And he helped himself to some steak quite nicely the other night so... <laughs> He's eating just as well as what we are, if not better, eh, Pikey? <laughs> yeah, and he's uh, quite partial to a bit of beef jerky. <laughs> Royal Marines are just softies, really, aren't they? Yeah, we, we... <laughs> well, it depends who you are, I suppose. <laughs> you've got four legs and you're cute, you're all right. <laughs> now, a lot of people ask me why I choose to work alone, that is, without a conventional crew. Well, there are a lot of reasons, but I think the main one is that I try to avoid that them and us situation. Very often, if you immerse with a community and you go in mob-handed with a crew of four, five, six people, you do create a them and us situation. And you actually affect the very thing that you're trying to observe. By working alone, just one man and his camera, as I do, then I think I have the least impact possible on whoever it is I'm, I am observing, in this case the Royal Marines. And um, it's much easier to be absorbed and then to build that relationship of all-important trust that allows me to do the work that I do. Now, I took this to an extreme uh, five or six years ago when I actually went through the Royal Marine training, so all 32 weeks of it. I wanted to understand what made a Marine tick. Now, that training was the hardest thing I've ever done. It was also the worst thing I've ever done and the best thing. And at the end of it, I was very proud to be presented with my own honorary Green Beret, still to this day my most prized possession. And one of the great consequences of having my own Green Beret was that I could then look a Marine in the eye. I'd been through that sort of rite of passage that he had been through uh, to get that all-important green lid, as they call it. And this time round, I think it helped me a lot in Afghanistan because they saw me as one of their own. And at the very least, they thought, well, he's not going to get in the way. I say I work alone. But this time, I took a particular friend with me, Paul Mattin. Now, Paul is an ex-Royal Marine himself. In fact, he was the officer who presented me with my green beret five years ago. And on this occasion, he was there to help me carry the equipment and also do a lot of the technical backup at night. So whilst I went out filming, he could stay behind, download all the material that I had filmed during the day. He was also great company, a huge morale booster. He knew the Corps, he knew the boys, he knew the men, he knew the way Royal Marines work, but his one particular talent was his coffee-making skills. Wherever we went, under any conditions, you could always guarantee that Paul would come up with the best espresso coffee. Checkpoints like Toki need to be supplied, of course, and it's impossible to get there by road. The place is riddled with IEDs, it's just too dangerous. So the only way to bring in the supplies, the rations, the water, the ammunitions, reinforcements, was by helicopter. The RAF transported a lot of the supplies in their massive Chinooks, especially the tons of mail that was coming in all the time from loved ones in the UK. Well, you can see the importance of the mail drop. This is just pure morale. So we're heading out to the forward operating bases and the lads waiting for the letters from home, the packages from home. Pure morale. And most of the time, the helicopters used for resupply were from the Commando Helicopter Force, nicknamed the Junglies. And these were an incredibly professional body of men who would fly night and day to resupply the checkpoints.
as I said, when I first arrived in Afghanistan, I came through Camp Bastion, and that's where I departed from as well. But before I left, I had one final place I had to visit. And this is the memorial to the fallen. Nearly 400 British soldiers that have died in the last 10 years. Dedicated to those who've fallen in the line of duty in Helmand province. 27th of March, 2006. 2007. 2008, 9. 2010. 2011. When you go home, tell them of us and say, for your tomorrow, we gave our today.